Welcome to Almost Impossible Book Club. Um, this is the first of uh, what we hope to be kind of a series of episodes we'll do um, that summarizes and reviews some of the, the big books that we really loved um, in researching um, some of the episodes uh, that you may have heard on The Manhattan Project and The Wright Brothers and others. And so today we are going back to the first episode and the book that basically inspired the entire show, uh, a book called American Prometheus. For those of you who uh, pay attention to movies that are coming out, this is also the basis of the Oppenheimer movie, in addition to the basis of episode one of Almost Impossible. So uh, here is the blurb from the back of the book. J. Robert Oppenheimer is one of the iconic figures of the 20th century, a brilliant physicist who led the effort to build the atomic bomb for his country in a time of war, and who later found himself confronting the moral consequences of scientific progress. In this, magisterial, in this magisterial acclaimed biography, 25 years in the making, Kai Bird and Martin Sherman capture Oppenheimer's life and times, from his early career to his central role in the Cold War. This is biography and history at its finest, riveting and deeply informative. Uh, it also won the Pulitzer Prize. So would recommend reading, but uh, if you don't want to read it, we're going to do a short episode about some of our favorite parts from American Prometheus. And hey. I'm Craig Cannon, one of your hosts. I'll be joined by my co-host, Tim Wong, in just a second. And we'd like to thank Cola Buskirk for helping us research this episode. We'd also like to thank Protocol Labs Ventures for making this show possible. Protocol Labs Ventures invests in startups across Web3, as well as those building on the Protocol Labs tech stack, which includes things like IPFS, Filecoin, and LibP2P. They also invest in companies pursuing breakthroughs in computing, like brain-computer interfaces. If you're a founder looking to raise a round in one of these areas, you can email funding at protocol.ai. All right, here we go. American Prometheus is a great book, uh, and we're willing to bet we haven't even seen the movie, but I already know that Christopher Nolan's going to leave out some of the best <laughs> stuff. Uh, and some of the best stuff that is in American Prometheus is actually about the young Robert Oppenheimer. Um, and I want to read this quote just to kick us off about the adventures of young Robert Oppenheimer. Quote, from the ages of 7 through 12, Robert had three solitary but all-consuming passions. Minerals, writing, and reading poetry, and building with blocks. Later, he would recall that he occupied his time with these activities, quote, not because they were something I had companionship in or because they had any relation to school, but just for the hell of it. By the age of 12, he was using the family typewriter to correspond with a number of well-known geologists about rock formations he had studied in Central Park, because you do that. Um, and not aware of his youth, one of these correspondents nominated Robert for membership in the New York Mineralogical Club, and soon thereafter a letter arrived inviting him to deliver a lecture before the club. Dreading the thought of having to talk to an audience of adults, Robert begged his father to explain that they had invited a 12-year-old. Greatly amused Julian, that's Oppenheimer's father, encouraged his son to accept this honor. On the designated evening, Robert showed up at the club with his parents, who proudly introduced their son as J. Robert Oppenheimer. The startup audience of geologists and amateur rock collectors burst out laughing when he stepped up to the podium. And in fact, a wooden box had to be found for him to stand on so the audience could see him more than the shock of his wiry black hair sticking up above the lectern. Shy and awkward, Robert nevertheless read his prepared remarks and was given a hearty round of applause. And I think this is kind of one of the reasons that we talked about earlier that makes Oppenheimer such a compelling figure. Right. Is that, you know, he is interested in more than just kind of like science narrowly writ. Right. He's interested in building. He's interested in poetry. And, and this is all stuff that kind of like interests him from a really early age. And I think that kind of like rounds the character of a scientist. Right. Like when we think about like scientists, we think about like these kind of very, you know, square people. Um, but Oppenheimer's cool. And I think that he's kind of like quite unusual um, as far as kind of our stereotype of scientists go. Yeah, and probably an autodidact uh, far past the average, especially for his like pre-internet era. You know, he's just like going out there, walking into Central Park, finding some rocks, getting the books, figuring out what they are, writing to the Mineralogical Society, uh, which is effectively like the same thing he'll do when he's at Harvard and then later Cambridge and then later Göttingen. And so to just give you another example of what Oppenheimer was like as a kid, basically, he goes to school in New York City. He eventually gets accepted to Harvard in Cambridge, Mass., and begins studying chemistry. Later, he realizes that actually his interest is in physics. 
So here's a quote from the book. By the end of his freshman year at Harvard, Robert decided that he had made a mistake in selecting chemistry as his major. I can't recall how it came over me that what I liked in chemistry was very close to physics, Oppenheimer said. It's obvious that if you were reading physical chemistry and you began to run into thermodynamical and statistical mechanical ideas, you'd want to find out about them. It's a very odd picture. I never had an elementary I never had an elementary course in physics. Though committed to a chemistry major, that spring he petitioned the physics department for graduate standing, which would allow him to take upper level physics courses. To demonstrate that he knew something about physics, he listed 15 books he claimed to have read. Years later, he heard that when the faculty committee met to consider his petition, one professor, George Washington Pierce, quipped, Obviously, if he, Oppenheimer, says he's read these books, he's a liar, but he should get a PhD for knowing their titles. His primary tutor in physics became Percy, Brig Ugh, became Percy Bridgman, who later won a Nobel Prize. So again, we have uh, Oppenheimer, uh, fake it till you make it. He's like, I'm interested in this stuff. I mean, he's uh, multiple quotes from his roommates uh, that appear in the book as well. It's like he wanted to appear cool all the time. But actually, you know, when they when they left his room and he closed the door to his dorm, uh, he was studying. He was researching other topics like learning about what at least the books he should have read on the subject. Yeah. And I think at an early age, um, this sort of shows the degree to which Oppenheimer, you know, is kind of just like building his public persona. Um, you know, later, you know, after uh, the war, he becomes kind of iconic. Right. Like he has this like very particular sartorial style, you know, with like a pipe and this hat and, and all this stuff. And it really kind of like, you know, he he's kind of like becomes iconic in a particular way. And it's sort of interesting that even at this early age, he's really kind of like interested in kind of like building like a persona. Right. Um, and, you know, sometimes that's at odds with what he actually knows or what he actually is qualified to do. Um, but but is a is an element of his personality that shows up at a really early age. So Oppenheimer will finish up his degree at Harvard, actually spending some of the summers in New Mexico, which is kind of like a foreshadowing of Los Alamos in the future. And after completing his degree, what's he going to do? He actually gets accepted to a lab in Cambridge, at Cambridge in the UK. Doesn't really work out for him. It's like not a culture fit. He's They're not doing the kind of physics that he wants to do. And eventually finds himself like in the Silicon Valley of physics at the time, which is Göttingen, Germany. So to give you a little bit of the color of that, uh, just a quick quote from the book, quote, It was Oppenheimer's good fortune to arrive shortly before an extraordinary revolution in theoretical physics drew to its close. Max Planck's discovery of quanta, photons, Einstein's magnificent achievement, the special theory of relativity, Niels Bohr's description of the hydrogen atom, Werner Heisenberg's formulation of matrix mechanics, and er Erwin Schrodinger's theory of wave mechanics. This truly innovative period began to wind down with Born's 1926 paper on probability and causality. It was completed in 1927 with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and Bohr's formulation of the theory of complementarity. By the time Robert left Göttingen, the foundations for po post-Newtonian physics had been laid. Um, and so... Oppenheimer's great timing. He just basically ends up in this place where there's a ton of really, really fascinating work being done. Um, and, you know, one of the really cool things is that this kind of, you know, sort of aimless young academic uh, that's not really sure what he wants to do, chemistry or physics, who's kind of fronting, really becomes like totally transformed by his involvement in the scene. Um, there's another great quote here, quote, in the highly competitive race to publish new findings, more papers on quantum theory were written from Göttingen than from Copenhagen, Cavendish, or anywhere else in the world. And Oppenheimer himself published seven papers out of Göttingen, a phenomenal output for a 23-year-old graduate student. Wolfgang Pauli used to, uh, began to refer to quantum mechanics as cannabin physics, boys physics, because the uh, authors of so many of these papers were so young. In 1926, Heisenberg and Dirac were only 24, year old, 24 years old. Pauli was 26 and Jordan was 23, right? And these are all collaborators that will go on to win, you know, numerous major prizes in science uh, and become close colleagues of Oppenheimer. Um, and again, you know, this is so important to his development, right? And points to the importance of, you know, just being in the right scene um, in order to kind of like really make a difference. In fact, Oppenheimer became so motivated and active uh, infamously 
uh, there was actually a petition by some of his fellow grad students when he was out there in Gottingen um, to uh, basically prevent Oppenheimer from speaking. It was a petition to basically shut Oppenheimer up. Um, and so he still brings some of these bad habits to you know his work. Um, one of my favorite is this quote from the book, quote, that spring, prompted by a remark from Heisenberg, Robert became interested in using a new quantum theory to explain, as he put it, why molecules were molecules. In very short order, he found a simple solution to the problem. When he showed Professor Born, right, his mentor, his notes, the old man was startled and very pleased. They then agreed to collaborate on a paper, and Robert promised that while he was in Paris for Easter, he would write up his notes into a first draft. But Bourne was, quote, horrified when he received from Paris a very spare four or five page paper. I thought this, that this was about right, Oppenheimer recalled. It was very light of touch and seemed to me all that was necessary. And Bourne, his mentor, ultimately eventually lengthened the paper to 30 pages, padding it, Robert thought, with unnecessary or obvious theorems. Uh, I didn't like it, but it was obviously not possible for me to protest a senior author. For Oppenheimer, the central new idea was everything. The context and academic window dressing were clutter that disturbed his acute aesthetic sense. Um, you know, what I love about that is basically like Oppenheimer just wants to get to the point. Um, he, you know, is, is more interested in kind of sketching out the solution and finding the solution for himself than like explaining it to other people. Um, and, you know, again, I think this is kind of like some of his still his old habits, I think, kind of like still leaking through. And so... After a prolific time in Germany where he kind of catches a, a wave of physics, he becomes a preeminent theoretical physicist. Uh, so now he's being courted. Uh, he actually joins uh, Berkeley at Cal to set up the theoretical <laughs> physics department. And um, one of the interesting things we see here now is kind of the um, shift of Oppenheimer where he was like, publishing a lot of papers to becoming a teacher. Uh, so now he's synthesizing ideas, helping other people get work done. So here we'll uh, go back to the book. Over time, Oppenheimer developed a uniquely open teaching style in which he encouraged all of his students to interact with each other. Instead of holding, uh, instead of holding office hours and seeing each student individually, he required his eight to 10 graduate students and half dozen, dozen postdoc fellows to meet together in his office. Each student had a small desk where he or she sat and watched Oppenheimer as he paced around the room. Oppenheimer himself had no desk, only a table in the middle of the room piled high with stacks of papers. A blackboard covered with formulae dominated one wall. Shortly before the appointed hour, these young men and occasional women would straggle in and wait for Opie as he uh, casually sat on the desk of the table lean or leaned against the wall. When he arrived, he zeroed in on each student's particular research problem in turn and solicited comments from everyone, uh, end quote. Also, one other interesting thing about Oppenheimer's teaching style. Uh, here's a quote from the book. Oppenheimer gave no final exams, but he handed out plenty of homework assignments. During each class, he would present a non-Socratic lecture, quote, delivered at high speed, recalled uh, Ed Gurjoy, a grad student from 1938 to 42. Students uh, felt free to interrupt Opie with a question. Uh, another quote, he generally would answer patiently, Gerjoy said, unless the question was manifestly stupid, in which event his response was likely to be quite caustic. Uh, so I, I don't think he like operated with kid gloves in these classes. And there are a couple other moments in the book where Oppenheimer essentially like guides students out of the field. Like, you don't you don't quite have what it takes, kid, like make your way uh, out. To kind of take you from the 30s to the Manhattan Project actually being created, uh, essentially what happens in Oppenheimer's life is he's a teacher uh, teaching theoretical physics at Cal. Uh, meanwhile, Germany is still a powerhouse in the physics world. Uh, and a very important discovery will be announced in 1939. Uh, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann will discover that they can split the uranium atom. Uh, so this is the, essentially the core discovery that allows the atomic bomb to be possible. Um, and interestingly, uh, many other physicists won't realize the importance, but Oppenheimer would almost immediately. So here's a quote from the book. Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann had successfully demonstrated that ura uranium nucleus could be split into two or more parts. 
They'd achieve fission by bombarding uranium, one of the heaviest elements, uh, with neutrons. Stunned by this development, Alvarez, uh, another physicist, stopped the barber mid-shop and ran all the way to the radiation lab to spread the word. When he told Oppenheimer the news, his reply was, that's impossible. Oppenheimer then went to the blackboard and proceeded to prove mathematically that fission couldn't happen. Someone must have made a mistake. But the next day, Alvarez successfully repeated the experiment in his lab. I invited Robert Oppenheimer over to see the very small natural alpha particle pulses on our oscilloscope and the tall spiking fission pulses 25 times larger. So again, what we're seeing here is like more energy coming out of the atom being split. Uh, back to the book. In less than 15 minutes, he uh, not only agreed that the reaction was authentic, but also speculated that in the process, extra neutrons would boil off that could be used to split more uranium atoms and thereby generate power uh, or make bombs. It was amazing to see how rapidly his mind worked. So here we have like the Oppenheimer, like immediately a uh, quick synthesis of all the ideas and uh, understanding their implications. So this will happen. Uh, Szilard, uh, Leo Szilard and Albert Einstein will actually write a letter to FDR, the president at the time in 1939, saying like, hey, this is possible, we can make a bomb. Nothing will happen for actually a couple of years. Then uh, Hitler will invade Poland. Uh, Pearl Harbor will happen. The U.S. will enter the war. And then uh, the U.S. will uh, renew their efforts to create uh, an atomic bomb program. So the, the seeds of the Manhattan Project get moving. Um, and Oppenheimer is ultimately recruited to direct the project. Um, he's going to be paired with uh, this guy by the name of Leslie Groves, um, who in many ways is kind of uh, Oppenheimer's, you know, total opposite. Uh, Oppenheimer is like smooth, not always down with the details, you know, a good team organizer. Um, and uh, and Groves, well, I'll just read this quote because uh, I think it probably will give you a flavor of how different this guy is. Quote, Nearly six feet tall and weighing over 250 pounds, Groves had muscled his way through life. Gruff and plain spoken, he had no time for the subtleties of diplomacy. Oh yes, Oppenheimer once remarked, Groves is a bastard, but he's a straightforward one. By temperament and training, he was an authoritarian. Politically, he was a conservative who barely concealed his contempt for the New Deal. The son of a Presbyterian army chaplain, Groves had studied engineering at the University of Washington in Seattle and later at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He graduated fourth in his class at West Point. Men serving under him grudgingly admired his ability to get things done. General Groves is the biggest SOB I have ever worked for, wrote Colonel uh, Kenneth D. Nichols, his aide throughout the war. He is the most demanding. He is most critical. He is always a driver, never a praiser. He is abrasive and sarcastic. He disregards all normal organizational channels. He is extremely intelligent. He has the guts to make timely, difficult decisions. He is the most egotistical man I know. I hated his guts, and so did everybody else. But we had our form of understanding. It's good. He's uh, good. I he's, so. good. I mean, he, he's also built the Pentagon. He's in charge of building uh, yes, the Pentagon. Yes, the Pentagon. Small projects like the Pentagon. Little, yeah, you may have known know him from uh yeah so essentially what happens is like leslie groves is the uh like the coo maybe he's the ceo i don't know uh he's doing the logistics and so he's actually in charge of choosing the uh the director of the lab which becomes oppenheimer uh another great quote about leslie groves and his like get shit done mentality uh goes if, if you just uh study like the calendar of the project so september 18th uh, 1942 gross formally took charge of the bomb project officially designated the manhattan engineer district uh but most often referred to as the manhattan project that very day he arranged to buy 1200 tons of high-grade uranium ore the next day he ordered the acquisition of a site in oak ridge tennessee where the uranium could be processed Later that month, he began a tour across the country of all the labs engaging in experimental work on uranium isotope separation, uh, end quote. So essentially, like, Groves is, Groves is getting it done. Um, and to kind of zoom out for those folks, like, this will probably be, like, skipped over in the movie. But the whole Manhattan Project from, like, Groves starting to dropping the bomb is less than two years. I think it's, like, 23, 24 months or something like that. <laughs> 
So it's crazy fast. So then basically after Oppenheimer gets recruited by Groves, which was debated, they were like, who's actually going to run this project? Who's qualified? And then multiple times Groves is like, if you have a better option than Oppenheimer, let me know. And he's like, give him a week. No one comes back with anything. So it's like, all right, we're going with Oppenheimer. Uh, so they have Oak Ridge. Oak Ridge is where they separate the uranium. And then they need to create a lab somewhere where they will actually design and engineer the bomb, which will become the, the famous Los Alamos location. That was actually not set in stone in the beginning. They're like, oh, maybe we'll do it in a city. You know, like maybe we have a lot of the stuff at, at Cal or at Harvard or, you know, many of these schools uh, where they actually have like, you know, a cyclotron, which is the device you use to separate the uranium. Uh, ultimately, Groves want secrecy so badly they actually decide to buy a boys' school in the New Mexico desert, which is Los Alamos. Uh, and so there's this moment where Oppenheimer and his collaborator, Ernest Lawrence, go and take a tour of these school buildings that are going to be part of this eventual site that they're going to build for Los Alamos. So, quote, wearing cowboy boots, Oppenheimer took Lawrence on a tour of the school buildings. For security purposes, they had introduced themselves under assumed names, but a Los Alamos student, Sterling Colgate, recognized the scientists. Suddenly, we knew the war had arrived here, Colgate recalled. These two characters showed up, Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones, one wearing a pork pie hat and another one wearing a normal hat, and these two guys went around as if they owned the place. Colgate, a high school senior, had studied physics, and he had seen photographs of Oppenheimer and Lawrence in a textbook. And soon after, an armada of bulldozers and construction crews invaded the school grounds. Um... And uh, ultimately, uh, Oppenheimer got what he wanted, a spectacular view of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, and General Groves got a site so isolated there was only a winding gravel road and one phone line into the place. So Los Alamos gets set up. Uh, they recruit a number of leading scientists to it. And ultimately, what happens is that Los Alamos gives rise to a pretty um, unique community in a lot of ways. Um, as they describe it in American Prometheus, quote, Los Alamos was always an anomaly. Hardly anyone was over 50, and the average age was a mere 25. We had no invalids, no in-laws, no employed, no idle rich, and no poor, wrote Bernice Broad in a memoir. Everybody's driver's license had numbers and no name, and their address was simply P.O. Box 1663. Surrounded by barbed wire, on the inside, Los Alamos was transforming itself into a self-contained community of scientists sponsored and protected by the U.S. Army. Ruth Marshak recalled arriving at Los Alamos and feeling, quote, as if we had shut a great door behind us, the world I had known of friends and family would no longer be real to me, unquote. So kind of as we said, so what happens at Los Alamos is more of the design, the, the physical engineering of building the bomb. So like we've made this discovery in 39 in Germany. The Americans realize it's possible to build a bomb, but how do you actually do this? Uh, there are several designs of how it might be done. Uh, ultimately, two of these will be implemented. One is called the gun method and one is called the implosion method. So the gun method is essentially putting like shooting a projectile into a core of uranium. Uh, then they'll start using plutonium to build bombs. And in the early tests of building a plutonium bomb using the gun method, essentially it was causing misfires uh, if the plutonium wasn't sufficiently enriched. And so this becomes like a pivotal decision point for Oppenheimer as a leader to instead shift away from the gun method to the implosion method. The implosion method being like you have spherical charges around a plutonium core. They all trigger at the exact same instant. They compress it and then the compression leads to an explosion. So here is a quote uh, from the book about that period in time and Oppenheimer making this choice. So from the book. In July 1944, however, it became clear that the test performed on the first small supplies of plutonium, that an, uh, an efficient plutonium bomb could not be triggered within the gun barrel design. Indeed, any such attempts would undoubtedly lead to a catastrophic pre-detonation inside the plutonium gun. So in other words, like it's a dud. Uh, later in this section... Uh, so on July 17th, Oppenheimer convened a meeting in Chicago, Chicago with Groves, Conant. Uh, Conant is a president of Harvard, uh, Enrico Fermi, and others to resolve this crisis. Conant urged that the aim to merely build a low-efficiency implosion bomb based on a mixture of uranium and plutonium. Uh, such a weapon 
would have had an explosive equivalent of only several hundred tons of TNT. Only after successfully testing a, a low efficiency bomb, Conant said, would the lab have the confidence to proceed with a larger weapon. Oppenheimer rejected this notion on the grounds that it would lead to unacceptable delays. Uh, just to pause really quickly to give you context, we're about like a couple months out from from the Nagasaki and Hiroshima bomb droppings. Uh, so back to the book. <clears throat> Oppenheimer then brought Princeton math, uh, mathematician John von Neumann to Los Alamos, and von Neumann calculated that the implosion was possible, at least theoretically. So Oppenheimer was willing to bet on it. The next day, July 18th, Oppenheimer summarized his conclusion for Groves. So this is what Oppenheimer wrote. We have investigated briefly the possibility of electromagnetic separation. It is our opinion that this method is in principle a possible one, but that the necessary, necessary developments involved are in no way compatible with the present ideas of schedule. In the light of the above facts, it appears reasonable to discontinue the intensive effort to achieve higher purity plutonium and to concentrate attention on methods of assembly, which do not require a low neutron background for their success. At the present time, the method to which an overriding priority must be assigned is the present uh, is the method of implosion. So again, to just give you kind of the recap here, Oppenheimer's like, you know what? I, I trust in von Neumann. I trust in the uh, physicists on my team. We are going to step away from the gun method, uh, further uh, purification of plutonium. We're switching to implosion, and this is actually what allows for uh, the, the larger payload bombs. So by late 1944, uh, the Manhattan Project is nearing the completion of uh, an actual bomb um, that they can use. Um, and uh, American Prometheus covers this really interesting segment where the researchers, now having realized they've built what looks to be you know, a potentially world-changing weapon, um, start debating the ethics of actually using um, the technology. So I want to read just kind of like two quotes about some of the debates that were going on. Quote, a number of scientists at Los Alamos began to voice their growing ethical qualms about the continued development of the gadget, meaning the bomb. Robert Wilson, now chief of the lab's experimental physics division, had quite long discussions with Oppie about how it might be used. Snow was still on the ground when Wilson went to Oppenheimer and proposed holding a formal meeting to discuss the matter more fully. And this meeting actually happens uh, in early 1945. There's a daytime colloquia that is held among the researchers um, about the kind of ethics of using the weapon. Um, and interestingly, Oppenheimer comes out um, arguing um, both that scientists don't have any particular um, role to play uh, in the decision whether or not to drop the bomb, but then also that the bomb might ultimately be a tool for peace. Quote, Oppenheimer was the speaker at a daytime colloquium, and according to Rosen, uh, one of the researchers on the project, the topic was, quote, whether the country is doing the right thing and using this weapon on real live human beings, unquote. Oppenheimer apparently argued that as scientists, they had no right to a louder voice in determining the gadget's fate than any other citizen. And later, Oppenheimer, quote, argued with his usual eloquence that although they were all destined to live in perpetual fear, the bomb might also end all war. Such a hope, echoing Bohr, that's Niels Bohr's words, was persuasive to many of the assembled scientists. Um, there's a, another interesting anecdote told by one of the researchers uh, that were sort of unsatisfied with this. Uh, they write, quote, we tried to organize meetings in some of the lecture rooms, and then we ran into opposition. Oppenheimer was against that. He said, it's not our task, and this is politics, and we should not do this. So what's so interesting about that is that these scientists have played such a major role in making this huge weapon possible, um, but that ultimately at this kind of critical phase before the bomb is actually dropped, um, they kind of back away. They sort of uh, essentially um, uh, uh, relinquish uh, their responsibility uh, over the bomb. Yeah, and also at the core of the debate is understanding the timeline of what's going on here. Essentially, a lot of the physicists and scientists that signed up for it thought they were going to use the bomb on the Germans, but Germany had already surrendered by the time they finished it. So they adjusted their sights to Japan, at which point many of the people were like, well, maybe this isn't quite what I signed up for. And so ultimately, although Oppenheimer will have a voice among uh, the politicians and Leslie Groves who are debating whether or not or how to use the bomb, 
uh, many of the scientists won't. And as we all know, they do decide to use the bomb. And so before it's going to be used in uh, warfare or going to be dropped on Japan, uh, they are debating whether or not they're actually going to do a test. So this will become known as what you may know as the Trinity test. Um, but it wasn't actually clear if this was going to happen or not because plutonium was so scarce at the time. Uh, Leslie Groves in particular didn't want to waste an ounce of it. Um, so quoting from the book, initially, General Groves had opposed the idea of a test of the implosion bomb, which again is the uh, spherical charges that come in on the plutonium to cause the explosion. Um, so Groves has opposed the test of the implosion bomb on the grounds that plutonium was so scarce that not an ounce should be wasted. Oppenheimer convinced him that a full-scale test was absolutely necessary because of the incompleteness of our knowledge. Without a test, he told Groves, the planning of the use of the gadget over enemy territory will have to be done substantially blind. And then later on, Groves called for speed, not perfection. Phil Morrison was told that a date near August 10th was a mysterious final date which we, who had the technical job of readying the bomb, had to meet at whatever cost in risk or money or good development policy. Uh, in parentheses, Stalin was expected de to the enter the Pacific War no later than August 15th. So as Oppenheimer recalled, uh, I did suggest to General Groves some changes in the bomb design which would have made more efficient use of the material, that being plutonium. However, uh, Groves turned down uh, that offer as jeopardizing the promptness of availability of these bombs. So again, like the Manhattan Project happens at an insane speed all the way up until the test, because now we're having Germany surrendering, Stalin maybe is entering uh, in the Pacific, and so the U.S. is trying to put in like a final blow to end the war at this exact moment in early August of 1945. Okay, and so as the Trinity test is coming up, uh, a bunch of bigwigs from D.C. fly in, Vannevar Bush, uh, James Conant from Harvard, uh, obviously Leslie Groves is going to be there, and Oppenheimer is stressing out because they've never obviously done a test at this scale before. And um, here's a quote from the book. Oppenheimer was very nervous, recalled uh, Joseph Hirschfelder, a chemist. As if people were not already anxious enough, a last-minute test firing of the implosion explosives without the plutonium core had just in indicated that the bomb was likely to be a dud. Everyone began quizzing uh, Kayatovsky. Oppenheimer became so emotional, he recalled, that I offered him a month's salary against $10 that our implosion charge would work. So, that evening, in an effort to relieve the tension, Oppie recited for Bush, that's a fan of our Bush, a stanza from the Bhagavad Gita. And so this is actually not the most famous quote uh, that maybe you've heard from the interview. Uh, and the quote goes like this. In battle, in forest, at the precipice in the mountains, on the dark gray sea, in the midst of javelins and arrows, in sleep, in confusion, in the, in the depths of shame, the good deeds a man has done before defend him. That night, Oppenheimer slept only four hours. General Thomas Farrell, Grove's executive officer, who was trying to sleep on the bunk in the next room, heard him coughing miserably half the night. So the day is July 15th, 1945. That's the day before the Trinity test. And this thing moves through some real twists and turns. Quote, uh, Robert awoke that Sunday, July 15th, exhausted and still depressed by the news of the previous day. But as he ate breakfast in the base camp uh, mess hall, he received a phone call from Hans Beta. Um, that's one of the researchers on the project, informing him that the dummy implosion test had failed only because of the blown circuits in the wiring. There was no reason, Beta said, why Kistakowski's design on the actual device shouldn't work. Relieved, Oppenheimer now turned his attention to the weather. Um, and having just cleared the circuitry problem on the bomb, um, the weather is looming in a really threatening way on the day of the test. Quote, that morning, the skies over Trinity were clear, but his meteorologist, Jack Hubbard, told him that the winds around the site were picking up. Speaking on the phone to Grove shortly before the general flew in from California for the tests, Oppie warned him, the weather is whimsical. In the late afternoon, as thunderclouds moved in, Oppie drove to the Trinity Tower for one last look at his gadget. Alone, he climbed the tower and inspected his creation, an ugly metal globe studded with detonator plugs. Everything seemed in order, and after surveying the landscape, he climbed down, 
got back into his vehicle and drove over to the McDonald ranch where the last of the men who had assembled the gadget were packing up their gear. A violent storm was brewing. Unquote. Yeah, so essentially they have an incredibly tight window in which they can drop this, and Oppenheimer is concerned that if the thunderstorms block the detonation of the Trinity test, he won't be able to work up the excitement in his team, and Groves is essentially going to force him to use the bomb without testing it at all. And so the this test comes down to literally the last hour, basically. Quote, at 2.30 a.m., the whole test site was being raked by 30-mile-an-hour winds and severe thunder showers. Still, Jack Hubbard, that's the meteorologist, and his small team of forecasters predicted the storm would clear at dawn. Outside the bunker at south 10,000 yards, Oppenheimer and Groves paced the ground, glancing to the skies every few minutes to see if they could discern a change in the weather. At around 3 a.m., they went back inside the bunker and talked. Neither man could stomach a delay. Quote, if we postpone, Oppenheimer said, I'll never get my people up to the pitch again. Groves was even more adamant that the test should proceed. Finally, they announced their decision. They would schedule the shot for 5.30 a.m. and hope for the best. An hour later, the skies began to clear and the wind abated. At 5.10, the voice of Sam Allison, the Chicago physicist, boomed across a loudspeaker outside the control center. It is now zero minus 20 minutes. At 5.30, they push the button and the Trinity test happens. Um, And it's amazing to read some of the quotes of people who were there that day and their sort of eyewitness account of what occurred. Um, I'll read a few here. Quote, James Conant, the president of Harvard, had expected a relatively quick flash of light, but the white light so filled the sky that for a moment he had uh, he thought, quote, something had gone wrong and, quote, the whole world had gone up in flames, unquote. Another eyewitness. um, Quote, I could feel the heat on my face a full 20 miles away. Joe Hirschfelder, the chemist assigned to measure the radioactive fallout from the explosion, later described the moment. Quote, all of a sudden, the night turned into day and it was tremendously bright. The chill turned into warmth. The fireball gradually turned from white to yellow to red as it grew in size and climbed into the sky. After about five seconds, the darkness returned, but with the sky and the air filled with a purple glow just as though we were surrounded by an aurora borealis. We stood there in awe as the blast wave picked up chunks of dirt from the desert soil and soon passed us by, unquote. And here are a couple more accounts from the Trinity test. So this is Richard Feynman, who was standing about 20 miles away. When he looked up, he saw white light changing into yellow and then orange. A big ball of orange, the center that was so bright, becomes a ball of orange that starts to rise and billow a little bit, and get a little black around the edges. And then you see it's a big ball of smoke with flashes on the inside of the fire going out, the heat. A full minute and a half after the explosion, Feynman finally heard an an enormous bang followed by the rumble of man-made thunder. And here's, uh, here's Frank Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer's brother. I think the most terrifying thing, Frank recalled, was this really brilliant purple cloud black with radioactive dust that hung there, and you had no feeling of whether it would go up or would drift towards you. And here's a quote from Isidore Rabi, who worked on the project about Oppenheimer and his observation of him at the Trinity test. Afterwards, Isidore Rabi caught sight of Oppenheimer from a distance. Something about his gait, the easy bearing of a man in command of his destiny, made Rabi's skin tingle. I'll never forget his walk. I'll never forget the way he stepped out of the car. His walk was like high noon, this kind of strut. He had done it. So a decision is made to inform uh, the Russians uh, about the existence of the bomb before it is used on Japan. Um, And what's wild is that uh, President Truman actually tells Stalin about the bomb, um, but uh, it actually largely passes unnoticed. Quote, Shortly after the Trinity test, uh, Oppenheimer had been relieved to hear from Vannevar Bush that the interim committee, that's kind of the governing committee over the bomb, had unanimously accepted his recommendation that the Russians be clearly informed of the bomb and its impending use against Japan. He assumed that such forthright discussions were taking place at that very moment in Potsdam, where President Truman was meeting with Churchill and Stalin. He was later appalled to learn what actually happened at that final Big Three conference. Instead of an open and frank discussion of the nature of the weapon, 
Truman coyly confined himself to a cryptic reference. Quote, on July 24th, unquote, Truman wrote in his memoirs, quote, I casually mentioned to Stalin that we had a new weapon of unusual destructive force. The Russian premier showed no special interest. All he said was that he was glad to hear it and hoped we would make good use of it against the Japanese. Unquote. This fell far short of what Oppenheimer had expected. As the historian Alice Kimball Smith later wrote, quote, what actually occurred at Potsdam was a sheer travesty, unquote. Okay, so now we're, we are at the moment. Um, it is August 6th, 1945, and this is the account of the Hiroshima bombing. So, quote, on August 6th, 1945, at exactly 8.14 a.m., a B-29 aircraft, the Enola Gay, named after pilot Paul Tibbetts' mother, dropped the untested gun-type uranium bomb over Hiroshima. John Manley was in Washington that day, waiting anxiously to hear the news. Oppenheimer had sent him there with one assignment, to report to him on the bombing. After a five-hour delay in communications from the aircraft, Manley finally received a teletype from Captain Parsons, who was the arming officer on the Enola Gay, that, quote, the visible effects were greater than the New Mexico test. But just as Manley was about to call Oppenheimer in Los Alamos, Groves stopped him. No one was to disseminate any information about the atomic bomb until the president himself announced it. Frustrated, <clears throat> Manley went for a midnight walk in Lafayette Park across from the White House. Early the next morning, he was told that Truman would make an announcement at 11 a.m. Manley finally got Oppie on the phone just as the president's statement was released on Nationwide Radio. Although they had agreed to use a prearranged code for conveying the news over the phone, Oppenheimer's first words to Manley were, why the hell do you think I sent you to Washington in the first place? That same day, at 2 p.m., Groves picked up the phone in Washington and called Oppenheimer in Los Alamos. Groves was in a congratulatory mood. I'm proud of you and all of your people, Groves said. It went all right, Opie asks. Apparently, it went with a tremendous bang. Everybody is feeling reasonably good about it, Opie said, and I extend my heartiest congratulations. It's been a long road. Yes, Groves replied. It has been a long road. And I think one of the wisest things I ever did was when I selected the director of Los Alamos. Well, replied Oppenheimer diffidently, I have my doubts, General Groves. Groves replied, well, you know, I've never concurred with those doubts at any time. And later on, quote, later in the day, the news was announced over the Los Alamos public address system. Attention, please. Attention, please. One of our units has just been successfully dropped on Japan. Frank Oppenheimer was standing in the hallway right outside his brother's office when he heard the news. His first reaction was, thank God it wasn't a dud. But within seconds, he recalled, one suddenly got this horror of all the people that had been killed. And one more quote. The crowd cheered and then roared its approval when Opie said he was proud of what they had accomplished. By Cohen's account, his, Oppenheimer's only regret was that he hadn't developed the bomb in time to have used it against the Germans. This practically raised the roof, end quote. And so following the droppings of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, essentially the military will take over this nuclear project. Um, importantly, Oppenheimer will still have a clearance, uh, security clearance as he's involved in the Atomic Energy Committee. However, uh, given his vision of how these bombs should be used and the visions of some of the people in the military, uh, there will be a divide. And so what this is going to lead up to is Oppenheimer's trial uh, as to whether or not he shared information with the, the Communist Party uh, during the creation of the, uh, the nuclear bombs. So um, here's a quote from the book. A man's life can turn on a small event. And for Robert Oppenheimer, such an incident occurred in the winter of 1942 to 1943 in the kitchen of his Eagle Hill home uh, that's in Berkeley. It was merely a brief conversation with a friend. But what was said and how Oppie chose to deal with it so shaped the remainder of his life that one is drawn to comparisons with the tragedies of classical Greek, Greece and Shakespeare. It became known as the Chevalier Affair. And over time, it took on some of the qualities of Rashomon, the 1951 film by Kurosawa, in which descriptions of an event vary according to the 
perspective of each participant. And so, yeah, so this is going to be the uh, the crux in the trial that Strauss is, uh, is going to use to try and separate Oppenheimer from the energy uh, committee. And uh, as, as I alluded to in the beginning, um, he will ultimately lose his clearance uh, through a, a lot of trials and tribulations uh, just one day before it was due to expire. And his sort of persecution uh, leads him to become something of a scientific martyr um, after the Chevalier affair. Um, he becomes kind of a representative of sort of science in the middle part of the 20th century. And uh, we thought this was a good place to uh, end this book report. Um, and I'll end with sort of a quote about kind of the Chevalier affair and its impacts. Quote, in the long run, however, Strauss's strategy backfired. The transcript revealed the inquisitorial character of the hearing and the corruption of justice during the McCarthy period. Within four years, the transcript would destroy the reputation and government career of Louis Strauss. Ironically, publicity surrounding the trial and its verdict enhanced Oppenheimer's fame both in America and abroad. Where once he was known only as the father of the atomic bomb, now he had become something even more alluring, a scientist martyred like Galileo. Outraged and shocked by the decision, 282 Los Alamos scientists signed a letter to Strauss defending Oppenheimer. Around the country, more than 1,100 scientists and academics signed another petition protesting the decision. In response, Strauss replied that the AEC's decision was a hard one, but the proper one. The broadcaster, Eric Severade, noted, he, Oppenheimer, will no longer have access to the secrets in government files, and the government, presumably, will no longer have the secret access to secrets that may be born in Oppenheimer's brain, unquote. But wait, there's more. Uh, something that didn't even make it into American Prometheus. Um, in December of 2022, Oppenheimer was cleared. So uh, here's a quote from, from Wikipedia, actually. U.S. Secretary of Energy Jennifer Granholm vacated the 1954 revocation of Oppenheimer's security clearance. Her, state, her statement said, in 1954, the AEC revoked Dr. Oppenheimer's security clearance through a flawed process that violated the commission's own regulations. As time has passed, more evidence has come to light of the bias and unfairness of the process that Dr. Oppenheimer was subjected to, <clears throat> while the evidence of his loyalty and love of country have only been further affirmed. Cool. And that wraps our book report on American Prometheus. Uh, we hope you join us next time and we'll continue to summarize uh, the books that make up uh, the research that we do for Almost Impossible.